Good morning. Welcome. I call this meeting of the Regional Transportation Committee for Tuesday, October 17th, 2023 to order. We will end with any public comments. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give it a second, but I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I will call your attention to item number three, the September 19th, 2023 Regional Trans Transportation Committee meeting summary, which is attachment A. And with that, we will move ahead into our action items. Our first action item is the Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments. Josh Schwenk, planner. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me one moment. All right, we do have several amendments to our transportation improvement program for you uh, this morning. Um, all of these are really related to cleaning up how projects are shown in the transportation improvement program. So the first two on your list are, uh, you'll notice funding being removed from pools. Um, the fifth project on your list is where that funding is going. Essentially, when we have more than one type of funding, Going to a single project, we want to split that project out so it only has one listing uh, rather than being listed in multiple pools. So that is that I-70 uh, from Chief Hosa to West Colfax project. The other projects in this top list here, um, essentially we already had the Federal Boulevard BRT project listed separately, um, but there is some funding within the Region 1 BRT pool that is going towards that project. So we're just splitting that funding out from the pool and putting that onto the individual project listing in the tip. The rest of the projects uh, in your list this morning are all related to the Colorado 119 corridor. Essentially, um, several different sources of funding have been awarded to this corridor over multiple calls for projects, waitlist process uh, from different agencies, et cetera, and were listed in multiple locations throughout the Transportation Improvement Program. So we're just trying to clean that up. Um, nothing's being removed. We're just reorganizing how that is shown. Ultimately, um, what we are going to be left with here um, is this RTD-sponsored project. This is for uh, BRT-related enhancements within the cities of Boulder and Longmont, including bus stops and a park-and-ride facility. The Boulder County-sponsored bikeway design between Boulder and Longmont. And then finally, the CDOT Region 4 project. This is for all of the improvements along the 119 Diagonal Highway Corridor between Boulder and Longmont. That includes the roadway operational improvements, transit operational improvements, uh, BRT stations, uh, queue jumps, as well as construction of the bikeway. Um, I'll also note that along with uh, reorganizing a lot of the funding and scope elements onto the CDOT project, uh, this also includes the newly awarded RAISE grant, as well as a CDOT TAP grant, um, along with some additional state legislative funding that had been uh, awarded to this project through the 10-year plan process. So with that, happy to take any questions from anyone. I also do have a proposed motion available for you in your packets. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? We have a motion. Director Wheel. Recommend the, oops, recommend the Board of Directors approve the attached project amendments. Seven transportation program. Point of Second. information. Thank Second. You um, <laughs> The, the motion is made to Board of Directors. Is that appropriate wording for this group? Or? Okay, just checking. Yep. Any further uh, discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. And any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. With that, we will move ahead to item number five, the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology. Techn I am having trouble talking this morning, and technology project selection, and we'll hear from Greg McKinnon, Program Manager of Transportation Operations. Sir. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, 
So the uh, Regional Transportation Operations Technology set aside was identified in the uh, TIP, and this was the process that we went through for the project uh, um, selection and recommendations. It's guided by the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan, which has the priority initiatives of improved situational awareness, improved um, performance monitoring, and improved multimodal and multi-jurisdictional coordination. The dates that we have up here illustrate the process uh, that was followed uh, that was in the uh, set aside guide. Uh, it was a two-step process where we had a call for letters of interest and then we had the uh, applicants and stakeholders uh, come together and collectively uh, we evaluated the letters of interest and um, you know, for the purpose of um, ensuring that we had quality applications uh, submitted. And then in uh, July, we received the applications. The um, panel was assembled and we reviewed, uh, we evaluated and reviewed the applications as per the, uh, the, the uh, set aside um, guide. Uh, the application scores and ra uh, rankings were done individually and then we uh, combined them for a ev uh, final evaluation and uh, made recommendations based on that. This is a list of the projects and the, the, the weighted scoring. The uh, project descriptions are in the packet. The, uh, so the weighted average score, the, the first column after the project name there, uh, is the scoring process that's in the guide, and it ranks from zero to five uh, is, is the top score. And the scores that were uh, applied were ranging from 1.1 to just short of 2.5, or uh, less than 50%. Um, to ensure the, that uh, there were no anomalies through the, the weighted average process, uh, the evaluation panel also looked at other uh, ways of, of, uh, of sorting the, uh, the applications. There was a, a sum score and then also the sum the individual rankings from each of the evaluators where a lower score is better than a higher score. And in each case, uh, it, the, the, the listing was about the same and identified kind of a, a lower tier in the, the bottom core, uh, quarter of the, of the list. This is showing the, um, the program allocations that are recommended. It is based on the application uh, desire where they, they request the money in the different uh, fiscal years. And so, uh, except in one case where we advanced uh, the funds to, uh, from FY27 to FY26 so that we have the, the three-year three -year program. In some cases, there were um, adjustments to the allocation from the request based on uh, the, the what, what equipment was uh, already out in the field and, and, uh, compared to the request, or um, there was a focus on the regional roadway system requirement for, for these funds, so there was adjustments there. And in two cases, there, the funding is contingent on an appropriate uh, concept of operations, which is a, a formal document describing the functionality and roles and responsibilities of the system um, before the full funding could be applied to the project. The total funding is, um, is less than the funds that we had available. The remaining funds are reserved and are gonna be applied to the next uh, call for projects which in this case is gonna be a year earlier because we're not programming out the full four years that we were intending. It's just these first three years. So uh, it will be coming in, in the, uh, the spring of 2026. I think it, this is our proposed motion, but I'm available for questions. Questions or comments? I'm making this way too <laughs> Do I have a motion? Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, I move to recommend the Board of Directors approve project allocations through the fiscal year 24 through 27 Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Transportation Improvement set aside, program set aside, and administratively modify the TIP. 
Okay, thank you very much. We have a motion. Okay, any further discussion? Oh, we got we got your second. Thank you. But is your microphone not working? I don't think that was intentional. <laughs> we, we did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion or comment? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. Extensions? Okay. Thank you very much. Motion passes. Thank you for being here, sir. And we'll move ahead to the corridor set aside selection. Uh, Nora Kern. Sub Area and Project Planning Program Manager. Good morning. Thanks for being here. All right. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair. So today, talking about another set aside, one of our new set asides, the corridor um, planning program. So uh, just a little background, this is, a, like I said, a new set aside that's focused on advancing the projects and priorities that are specifically identified in the Regional Transportation Plan. So it is focused on um, kind of the key regional corridors that are identified. Um, so it's actually only, it's limited only to the corridors that are specifically identified in the Regional Transportation Plan, which you can see on the map there. Um, this is one of our new format or CLIP set-asides where Dr. Cog is retaining the funds and will uh, act as project manager and manage procurement to kind of help facilitate um, the project, um, but of course still working closely with our um, member jurisdictions and other regional partners. So we had a pilot of this um, program through which we did the, or are currently doing the Alameda Avenue study and the South Boulder Road study. So um, as it becomes formally a set aside, we have $3 million over the, the 2024 to 2027 tip. And we do plan on splitting these funds into two two-year funding cycles. Um, quick note, there were, of all the quarters that are in, or all the projects that are listed in the Regional Transportation Plan, there were a couple that we did exclude from consideration, which include corridors for which other work is already happening, either planning or construction. Um, as well as limited access roadways and trails and multi-use paths. So our process, um, we um, actually started off over the summer by looking at all of the corridors in the Regional Transportation Plan and doing some initial analysis to, to identify which corridors may be um, the best fit for this program and to kind of provide some guidance to our member governments. We then, um, in July and August, had a letter of interest window and had some meetings with um, different jurisdictions about projects that they were interested in, in uh, putting forward for the program. In September, we had a selection committee, which included staff from um, CDOT Regions 1 and 4, RTD and Dr. Cog, and uh, made a recommendation. And now we're here um, in September, October for um, TAC, RTC, and board approval. Um, I will note too, this is the, we are planning on having a second call for uh, letters of interest for that 2026 to 2027 funds that will be in the summer of 2025. So just uh, real quick that we had um, three quarters submitted by four different jurisdictions. So I wanted to kind of run through them very quickly. The first one is the Sheridan Boulevard corridor. It's listed in the first staging period, 2020 to 2029 in the regional transportation plan. Um, in the plan, it extends from 52nd all the way south to Hamden. It's identified for Vision Zero corridor improvements. Um, it had an average equity index score of 31.76, and this one was submitted by both Lakewood and Denver. And we have a, a rough estimate of a, a quarter million dollars funding request for the study. The next one is the East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit Extension. Um, it was submitted by Aurora. It's also in the first staging period and would be looking at um, bus rapid transit service and supporting safety and multimodal improvements, um, extending the bus rapid transit from 225 to E470. Um, so this one has the a second highest equity index of score of any corridor in the region, um, and the estimated funding request is a million dollars, which would allow for kind of a full corridor study, alternative analysis, and get us ready to go into the, the NEPA process. And then our third quarter was submitted by Lakewood, um, and it's a West Colfax transit study, um, roughly running from Sheridan to the Oak Street station. 
Um, this one's not specifically in the regional transportation plan, although there are several kind of overlapping similar projects um, and had a funding request of about 30 to 50,000. So our, our evaluation criteria here, um, you can see on the screen, you know, generally alignment with MetroVision and the regional transportation plan, as well as analyzing the benefit to environmental justice communities, regional impact and overall planning need. Um, you can see the average total scores for the three corridors here. Um, Sheridan did receive the highest, followed by the West Colfax, um, or sorry, the East Colfax BRT study. So the selection committee recommends funding the Sheridan Boulevard Division Zero Quarter Study and the East Colfax BRT Extension. Um, the West Colfax Transit Study was not recommended at this time because it didn't um, match exactly what was in the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, we have spoken with Lakewood if they are interested. In, this, in looking at transit on the corridor, it can be um, part of an update to the regional transportation plan in the future. And then finally, if we have any unused funds, we plan on holding those um, for the second two-year cycle um, in 2026 to 2027. So with that, I have a proposed motion for you, but also happy to take any questions if there are any. Go, Michael Bruce. Maybe none of them work. Yeah. There we go. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Um, quick question just on logistics and next steps. So this, the Sheridan from 52nd to Hampton is an example. So does this money, does Dr. Cog solicit the consultant support or do the two local agencies solicit consultant support for that? Yeah, great question. I mean, the next step will be to f figure out a scope. We know there's already some work that's been done on the corridor, so we want to, particularly in Sheridan, so we want to kind of figure out exactly what we want to look at. But then, yes, we would lead the procurement, um, and we probably would invite any interested local jurisdictions or CDOT to serve on a selection committee to help us pick that consultant. Great. We are interested. Great project. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Got one, which is, is I, I asked uh, on Friday when we did some, some prep work for this as well. So the 52nd to Sheridan obviously impacts Edgewater, which is, is the municipality I'm from. And we've got a stretch that we're working with CDOT already. So that, that necessarily won't impact that entire area from 52nd to Hampton if there's already work being done, correct? Yeah, that's correct. We definitely would want to build on what's already happening, and I think there's a couple stretches where there's has been current work or kind of recent work. So um, again, kind of figuring out what the gaps are, but also kind of helping build that regional vision that kind of um, expands and connects all all the different jurisdictions on the corridor. And if, if you already addressed this specifically, I apologize. Can you talk just briefly about the equity index and how that's determined and what goes into it? Sounds very complicated, yeah. I imagine. <laughs> Um, yes, let's see if I could do it from the top of my head. So this is a, a, a new product that Dr. Cog has developed in the last year or so um, after pretty extensive um, research, internal discussions, as well as some focus groups. Um, and it's, it's really looking at kind of um, a more nuanced way to look at equity across the entire region as opposed to um, some of the environmental justice scores are either yes or no, you're in or out. And so um, what it looks like, it's actually three different kind of bucket scores. So the first is mobility um, challenges, so looking at demographics around access to vehicles and transit. The second bucket is looking at economic um, factors, so low-income populations, et cetera. And then the third bucket is looking at race and national origin. And so essentially every census tract <laughs> in the region is given a, a separate score kind of based on demographics in each of those three buckets, and then they're combined for a single equity score. And the idea is that it kind of allows more of a con continuum of analysis to kind of compare different regions, but also kind of see within each region is it, you know, potentially disadvantaged due to economics or is it due to, you know, mobility challenges or other things like that. Thank you very much. Very helpful. I appreciate yeah. that. Any other questions or comments? Sorry, one more logistical question. So it looks like you'll be kicking off Q3 or Q4 of 24, and then what's kind of an estimated time frame for completion of the study and recommendations? Yes, so I think both, there's some flexibility, so part of that scoping conversation will be figuring out is it 12 months, is it 18 months for each study. Um, we hope to go as quickly as possible, so as soon as the board approves 
uh, the, the studies, we would then work on getting that scope ironed out and then moving to procurement. Um, I think we are still waiting on the IGA with CDOT, and so that would kind of be the a once that's ready to go, we can um, kind of move forward with procurement. But in a perfect world, I'd love to kind of hit the ground with procurement in January of 24, um, have somebody on board, you know, in a couple months, and then really get underway with Ernest in like April. It's kind of my target. And then, yeah, I think, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, please. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I think um, East Colfax is, well, they're both in the first staging period, so there's a good bit of urgency for both. Um, so I think if we could do it in 12 months, that would be, you know, something we'd like to do, but depending on the scope of work, could be 18 months. Sure. Oh, so he thought, oh, he I thought your hand was very Okay, sharp. I'm just going on what I'm yeah. told. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and Ron, he also thought you had something to say? You're just making stuff I up. thought it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you, Nora. I, I wasn't going to, but Jessica, your questions are really important. And maybe just a little bit more context to build on uh, Nora's presentation. You know, we created, this is one of the new set-aside programs that uh, was created in this current transportation improvement program. In order to give us some tools to work with jurisdictions across the region to advance some of these really important regional corridors and particularly focused on ones that are very complex, ones that have multiple jurisdictions that cross jurisdictional boundaries. It might be a state highway that passes through multiple jurisdictions, and it's just really tough for any one individual jurisdiction to sort of advance or work on those projects and have sort of a, a more cohesive, comprehensive comprehensive view of those corridors. So, you know, we're trying to stay in our lane. We're trying to pick those appropriate corridors where it makes sense to maybe take a more regional view and convene all of the partners to really figure out what the best approach to those corridors are. Um, so that's kind of why we're doing this. And then the way we're approaching this in order for to kind of be efficient with the funds and with contracting with CDOT is Dr. Cog actually being the grant recipient of the set aside program doing one grant agreement with CDOT instead of granting out to sub awardees the funds and having multiple grant agreements then individually with CDOT. So trying to be efficient with both the money and the process. Thanks for the question, Jessica. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. The Board of Directors approved funding for Sheridan Boulevard Vision Zero Quarter Study and the East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit Extension Study through the first two years of the quarter planning. Tip set aside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Stewart. Do we have a second? Yeah. <laughs> Director Williams. <laughs> a, a, a very muted Director Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? None. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Lee opposed nay. And any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, moving ahead into informational briefings. Next up, Regional Transportation Plan Cycle Amendments. Alvin Bidal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Uh, so this will be the final formal presentation we have before you this morning, and we'll be discussing what we call cycle amendments here at Dr. Cog. Um, so I will go through some quick background, some refresher for all, and then outline what we have received through this process and some of the next steps and milestones we're looking at as staff. So starting off with that refresher, we do have our most recently adopted regional transportation plan. That was back in September of last year. It was a pretty big effort to update for the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. And so through that effort, we actually got our federal partners to agree to a reset of our four-year clock. So we update this plan every four years. But in between that, those four-year cycles, we do provide an opportunity for project sponsors to make targeted revisions to projects in the plan. So we recognize some things do change in between those four years. We want to make sure we're capturing those that are needed. So that's what we call our cycle amendments process. It typically takes about six months. We're actually planning for nine months this time just to make sure we account for all the different coordination and modeling we need to do with our partners. 
And then even though this is just an amendment to the RTP, not a full-scale four-year update, we do still have to meet all of our federal requirements like fiscal constraint, federal air quality conformity, and the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. So we asked for three specific things during this cycle amendments process, adding a new project to the plan, removing a project, or what we most often typically see are just major changes to existing projects. Um, you want to move it between the years, the cost has increased substantially, or you're changing the scope significantly. You received six amendments during the call. Um, during the, the month-long call, I will note that there was a seventh amendment that came in, but we determined that it wasn't necessary, so it's not reflected on this list. Um, the revisions are a mix of new projects, four of those being requested, a scope change, and then a change to the staging period in the project. So those are from Boulder, Commerce City, Lone Tree, and Weld County. And the list is provided in your packet as well. We also provided a map of that location, of those locations of those projects. Um, it's a mix of like Port Boulder, Bat Lanes, Siding and Striping, so business access transit lanes, um, versus uh, a new grade separation at Lincoln and Havana related to the I-25 Lincoln interchange. So um, a mix of project revisions and requests from our project sponsors. Like I mentioned, we wrapped up our call for amendments that ran through the month of September. Right now, we're doing some final coordination with project sponsors, just some extra information that we need from them. Um, where is the funding coming from? Um, more justification for what could potentially be a request in the RTP. Um, it's just we need any extra information to help make an informed decision. Uh, following that, we want to get into modeling. So we anticipate that taking two to three months, working with our external partners, making sure we're doing all of, all of our federal air quality and state greenhouse gas emission modeling. By January, we want to have a finalized draft of the RTP, as well as all the different appendices that change when you make a change to the RTP. So we're looking at potentially five different changes to appendices, uh, and one of those will be the greenhouse gas transportation report. February through March is when we're planning to have our public and stakeholder review period. So that includes our 30-day public review period, our public hearing, and then also making sure the Transportation Commission and the Air Pollution Control Division also have their review periods as part of requirements. And then we're aiming for an April adoption of the board, by the board, um, so TAC and RTC recommendations around that time as well. Following that, staff will submit to our federal partners, and then we'll keep chugging along to make sure the regional transportation plan and all of its different appendices meet the state's new accessibility requirements that come into force next summer. So a lot of work over the next six months to move this project along. Not only are we looking out to the adoption next April and requirements by next summer, we're also already planning the next major four-year update to the RTP. So that needs to be adopted by the winter of 2026, approved by the winter of 2026. So we're already back counting what does that look like in terms of adoption, uh, committee recommendations, solicitation period, the work we have to do for modeling. And so we are planning for about a two-year long process to get that going. So right after we finish our cycle amendment process, we're going to get going on our regional transportation plan update that we envision taking about two years. Um, overlaid with that are also two new tips that are also coming down the pipeline, one that won't will have a new call for project, and then the second one that will have what you're typically more familiar with, a regional and sub-regional call for project. That concludes my briefing. Chair. Thank you very much. We'll uh, get questions here in a second. I'll start with one. Um, and this is just for clarity, these are amendments, yet the revision type, four of them are new projects, which suggests that's not an amendment, it's something new. How, how am I misunderstanding there? Oh, so we uh, define amendments um, uh, through the, let's see, the appendix that was shown on uh, the screen, um, but in between the four-year cycle, we recognize that there could be new projects that come up that need to be in our regional transportation plan, either funded by our regional partners or our local, locally funded by like project sponsors. So adding a new project can be an amendment, um, but because it's occurring during an amendment cycle and not our typical four-year update, we do have some additional justification questions around how does it align with the current RTP priorities, um, the region's priorities, or the community's priorities. So trying to provide some justification and information to staff just so we can see uh, why this new project that didn't come forward in the last major update uh, needs to be included now. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Ron or Doug, one right. of you. Arm wrestle. Sorry, I, I, was, I was also going to mention the 
especially for new projects, but really for all the projects that we consider during the amendment cycle, the financial constraint piece is really important. If someone's bringing forward a big major project to add to the plan that was already financially constrained, we need, we need really good um, justification for how the region is going to be able to afford that new investment that wasn't previous, previously identified in the, in the Thank you, Ron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Ron stole my comments, Sorry. but I, uh, but he, he was very accurate. And I, but I also wanted to point out that you know the timeline that that Alvin showed. Um, you know, we were asked quite often why we only do these cycle amendments every other year. We used to do them every, every year back in the day, or at least offered the opportunity. Um, the timeline for the completion is it's literally 10 months it takes to do something like this. It's a tremendous amount of work, especially now with the new greenhouse gas rule on top of our conformity determination of the federal NACs. So there's a lot of work that goes into this. So I just want you to be all aware that's the reason why we only do it as often as we do. Quite frankly, you know, it's a four-year plan. We should be able to plan at least for four years. We do know that things come up periodically and where we're, we welcome those, but um, but hopefully we can make a pretty good stab when we adopt it. Um, actually, Thank you very much to both. Other questions, comments. Director Ward, we've moved very quickly through the agenda, and we're just about done. So, <laughs> well, welcome. A uh, couple of. <laughs> A couple of uh, comments from the chair before we move into member comment or other, other matters. Oh, thank you very much. I apologize. I just kind of moved on with the agenda. So thank you, and we'll look forward to hearing, uh, hearing from you again on other matters. So thank you. Uh, a couple of things from the chair before we move into member comment and other matters. Of course, parking passes. If you park downstairs, be sure to get that from our birthday person today. Birthday boy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And then, and then tomorrow is Thursday. I'm sorry, Thursday is Wynn's birthday. So now her birthday was probably Wednesday, but she probably moved it to Thursday just to avoid any fear of a singing telegram, which is which is what we did for Doug last month when his birthday fell on the Dr. Cog night. So you may want to go back and look at, at the new video from that meeting of, of Doug being sung to. So and I'm on record that I hate all. <laughs> We surprised him, and he was not necessarily happy, but that's okay. Uh, and then just one other comment for those of you that were able to attend our, our awards uh, celebration. Thank you for being there. Uh, we were uh, – uh, it, was, it was a good evening, and it was great recognizing some of our past members of, of this group. So with that, uh, we will move on to member comment and a report from the Colorado Department of Transportation. I'll start with saying um, I'm going to pass this over to uh, Commissioner Hogan to start. And then I'll make a few comments, and I'll send it over to Jessica Micklebust. Nothing's happening at CDOT. And, uh, Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a lot to tell you about all of that. So uh, I'll start with, uh, with uh, Commissioner Holgain, please. Yeah, not a whole lot of comments. We do have our Transportation Commission meeting uh, workshops tomorrow, starting with our retreat and our annual uh, training. And then we have packed agenda, as always, um, for Thursday. Uh, we do have, I, I believe it was mentioned last month, but we do have six new commissioners, and so a lot of onboarding, a lot of getting people on the right track. Um, in terms of uh, local stuff, we're just getting a lot of questions about our, um, um, BRT and just trying to figure out how to ensure that all the voices are included as part of this study process, but um, that's pretty much it on my end. All right, a couple of things. Um, you might have heard that uh, CDOT got federal redistribution money this year, $179 million, which is record. I would never had that much money. Do you remember ever having that much money, Jeff? Not that much. I think 143 or something like that was what I saw in the stats. But anyway, that's a lot of money, and when we figured it all out, it's about $140 million that we had available to put to, pro to projects that we hadn't funded. And some of those projects are fairly interesting. Um, two of them, we made uh, 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 appropriations last month fixing poor interstate pavement on um, I-70 East. And, um, and I think on 70, I think, was some as well. Avalanche mitigation, culvert repair and replacement. It's not sexy, but I'll tell you, across the state of Colorado, really important to get that done. 
uh, rest areas have been a big issue for us. Uh, we only put $10 million into that, and that really doesn't do a lot. As you know, some of our rest areas have been closed for a long time, one on South uh, I-25, and that's at the Pueblo area, and that's going to be revamped and fixed, and it'll be more efficient, more safe, um, environmentally friendly, those kinds of things. Um, and um, hopefully we're going to have, a, I hope, a workshop um, coming up soon to talk about the rest of the rest areas. I get more calls on rest areas than almost anything you probably do, too. No, I get a lot. I get a lot. Yeah, it's the biggest one. Um, why? Why can't we stop and use the restroom? Um, rockfall mitigation, MASH guard, guardrail compliant uh, guardrail, safer. Uh, capital construction cost escalation. You know, we did something last year where we put some funds in because all of our bids are coming in higher than, than we anticipated, and it really delays everything that we do. So to have a pot of money that allows us to pull that money out and get those projects done is really important. Um, light fleet and maintenance equipment, um, a small amount of money on that, small amount of money on a couple of other things. The most interesting thing on this on this list is number seven, which is transit and rail planning, which was a big surprise to all of us on the Transportation Commission who didn't know that we were looking at possibly doing a train to Steamboat Springs. So uh, this amount of money is $5 million that's being requested of the Transportation Commission to do a service development plan um, using the um, tracks that go through Moffat Tunnel from Denver over to, to Glenwood Springs. So we have a workshop on that tomorrow. We're eager to hear more about it. Certainly, it's the governor's priority to get rail, um, enhance rail in the state of Colorado. So um, that might be something we have a robust discussion about um, to see uh, what does that service development plan entail, how soon can it be done. All the things Jessica was just talking about with other projects, you know, we want to be sure it's efficient, efficient use of money. Second thing I wanted to say was... Um, you know, transportation demand management is really important, and this group has been really involved in that. And we will hear from um, Crystal Valley Interchange. Uh, we won't be voting on it this month, but we'll hear about it and about the TDM uh, process that the developers and um, Castle Rock have worked to put those criteria in in order to get a 1601 approval, which means that they can add an interchange there. So that's going to be really important. And so, you know, it's interesting because years ago, we didn't talk about anything like that. What are the impacts of a new interchange and how do you um, change those impacts and, and provide for multimodal options there? And if you're going to add a whole new city in 20 years, what else are you going to add to make sure that that's not a uh, a congested area that doesn't doesn't work efficiently. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is one that's near and dear to my heart, and that's the Colorado Transportation um, uh, Improvement. No, Colorado Transportation HPTE. <laughs> I can never remember what our new acronym is. Um, it's our effort at um, safety enforcement program, and you might have heard about this. This is a pilot program that we um, entered into with a company called Blissway, and uh, we put it on the Mountain Express corridors to begin with to capture violations of weaving in and out in, trans in uh, uh, toll lanes, managed lanes, that are um, so unsafe that it, it seems to be um, the impetus for accidents all the way along the line. And so it's been a real big issue for us. And in the area that I represent on I-25, um, almost every day you will see an accident that's caused in, in some manner, and then the toll lanes are closed or everybody has to shift into the toll lanes. It's just not a safe situation. And so we uh, did this Blissway pilot on there. It started in September, and it was um, a courtesy violation, uh, 40,000 violations captured violations in three weeks from the mountain corridor, 470, and I-25. And I'm not surprised. You're not surprised, are you? No. Um, because this weaving has just become a way for people to circumvent traffic. They use it to get in and out of traffic. So anyway, starting October 1st, the violators are getting an absolute violation. They're getting a formal violation. $75 for your first violation, and then it can, if you don't pay it within 20 days, it goes to 150 And we have legislation that says we can charge up to 250 
And um, if you get one violation and you go on to 470, you get another violation. I mean, you, you don't just get one a day and you're done. If you're violating, you're going to get every violation that you, that you give. So it's pretty interesting. And um, the numbers um, are reported uh, that are just phenomenal. And our hope is that those numbers hit a crescendo in the next couple of months and then they go down. Because what we want is behavior change. We want people to realize that that's not what they're supposed to do and it's unsafe. So uh, that's the, the big deal from us. It's, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have that. Uh, it's movable and Blitzway can move those cameras. I asked what your capture rate is and they think 90% is what they're able to do. So uh, anyway, pretty exciting to have that. Um, because for lots of reasons, those managed lanes have to work efficiently. Um, if they don't, people won't use them. If they don't use them, we won't get the toll revenue. If we don't get the toll revenue, we won't be able to pay the bonds that built the roads. It's a, a whole thing. So, um, And then I know you're all interested about the Pueblo derailment. And uh, Jessica, you prepared to talk about that, or do you know anything about it? I've got some information, but... Go ahead. I okay. can read the news articles right okay. here. <laughs> okay. That's actually that's a, it's in region two, so I'm tracking with it, but I'm not at the at the helm by any means. Okay. I got a little bit of information yesterday when um, uh, the region two director called. Um, so you read the articles. We can't do anything to clean it up until there's been a, a determination by the NTSB of what happened. And then we can move the coal off the roadbed and see what damage to the roadbed there is. Then there has to be a determination of whether our bridge was at fault or whether the derailment caused the bridge to fail. So all of that is coming out. I think we're looking at $10 million initially to, um, to fix the bridge or repair the bridge. Um, and then it's about a 50 mile, um, drive around. So we're telling people here are the alternate routes. We're not telling them to go on the local roads because that's not our road. But if you take the state roads, 50 mile turnaround. So we don't know how soon it'll be fixed. Um, of course, you know, we want to do it as soon as possible. Um, so everything is reliant on what the determination by NTSB is on that, um, on that derailment. That's what I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Excellent update. Um, busy in Region 1. So we have the Federal Bus and Rapid Transit Project. We're really excited. We have consultants on board, and we have officially kicked that off. So we will be doing possibly a small media-type event just to celebrate that that project is well on its way. Colorado Boulevard Bus and Rapid Transit, we are reviewing RFPs that have been received, so we're hopeful to get a consultant on board by hopefully early of 2024. I-25 Segment 2 from US 36 to 104th, this is an area where we do have the Blissway technology. So of interest, we will be able to use um, revenue from safety violations to hopefully pay for safety improvements. So it's kind of a, a weird thing because you we need the violations to keep paying for the improvements, but we don't want the violations. So, um, but yeah, to the point, you know, every day I, I watch people just veer. I came US 36 today. I was actually in the toll lane um, and just watch people, you know, kind of use it just like a regular lane. It's, it's shocking and very, very dangerous. We did have our first public meeting for the I-270 um, environmental impact statement. That was our first kind of big public outreach since we originally kicked this project off years ago. This is our new... Um, our new approach to looking at the project. And we had about 80 people in, in attendance and we had many uh, comments submitted via email. So we're collecting those and looking at the feedback we've got on that project, but it was a, it was a nice turnout. Uh, we do have the Floyd Hill project ongoing as well as many, many construction projects along to um, I-70. Uh, which brings me to just some points for construction season. This is a tricky time of year. We've got fantastic weather. We're going to tap into it as long as we can for construction projects. But sometimes we end up then kind of weaving and integrating a little bit of rain, snow into construction zones. So just some reminders to please allow space if you're in a construction zone. Obey the speed limits. It is feels really slow, but you can be the person that makes the change. If you go slower, people behind you will slow down. Please be aware of construction workers. Move over for flaggers. It's not a fun job to stand out there and try and make people slow down. Do not cross the solid lines in construction zones. Plan for delays. Anticipate lane shifts and know before you go. So our co-trip app has 
fantastic real-time information. Um, and of note, the 115 detour that we are recommending in Region 2 does have construction going on. So it is it is a challenging route. Um, you know, we didn't know we were going to be using it. So just plan plan ahead and just, you know, respect the construction workers. So with that, transitioning to snow, we have gotten snow in the high country. Um, Mount Blue Sky, previously known as Mount Evans, is now closed for the season. We have gotten snow, and so it's it's done, but to that point, our um, professional maintainers have been in spot training, snow plow operator training, and they are prepped and ready to go. We've got the plows ready, cleaned, mobilized. We've got all our winter materials, and we have moved into snow shift, and so we're just waiting. I think they're kind of excited. I'm not so much, but... Um, <laughs> but again, you know, don't try and pass the plows. It's a really important message as well. They, they have a really hard job to do. And we have a fast, fantastic customer service line. Happy to send that out if you're getting curiosities or complaints or inquiries about how do we plow, when do we plow, which roads take priority over others. Um, interstates are always our number one priority to keep the public moving, and then we kind of move on from there. So that's a little bit what's going on in Region 1. So, Williams, you had a question that looked like earlier. Okay, that. Okay, fantastic. I, uh, Ron, no, I, I was just going to give two compliments real briefly. The, the Floyd Hill project, I was lucky enough to go to a program presented by the project manager. Amazing project, great information, just a, a, what a project that is. And I know you have lots of those, but that's one that just really stood out. And then also uh, the Jeff Tag meeting that you were at. Uh, I am so appreciative of, of the quality information that CDOT provides about what's going on around Jeff Tag. Jessica, thanks for that. The construction zone safety issue is a really important one, and I wonder how much you've, CDOT has evaluated sort of the crash history in construction zones. I, my recollection is that there is some state statute authority for CDOT to deploy photo speed enforcement construction zones. Am I remembering that correctly? Do you know? But, and I, I guess if I'm remembering that correctly, I wonder if CDOT would ever consider deploying that technology in construction zones to, because travel speeds through construction zones can just be tremendous and really crashes. I might phone a friend on that. I'm not particularly aware of photo enforcement in construction zones. We do have the new state law where you either need to move over if there's any type of flashing lights, even CDOT vehicles, which are not the um, emergency responder vehicles, but you're supposed to move over at least one lane. And if you cannot move over, you need to slow down 20 miles below the posted speed limit. So if the speed limit's 50, you need to slow down to 30 miles per hour. I'll look into the photo um, option and get back to you. I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone else? Okay, I, sorry. Oh, thank you. And, and question for Karen, that with the new monies, and this ties into the enforcement um, and the, uh, I think, the uh, expanded transit uh, conversation we're having, can any of that money be used for, for I, I, if nothing else, salaries, um, to bump the salaries of drivers so that we don't have the driver shortages, so that we, we actually have the ability to hire people to meet the service needs and also can it go into increased enforcement you know we all know it's it's just um uh terrible on the roads and it's it's a competition and it's it's hazardous speeding and and, and then there's the crashes and then we all get congested and and it, it the cycle gets worse um just uh, wondering if if these new monies can be spent in those areas so the money has to go back to the quarter that it's generated and um, it's for safety enforcement issues, I think. And so we can use it to make improvements, but I don't think we can use it for salaries or anything like that. So I will ask uh, Piper Darlington, who's our CTIO director, um, about that specifically. But I don't think that's come up, and I, I'm going to guess it's probably not going to be able to be used for that, but I'll let you know. Figure out ways to hey if if drivers are making 40 they need to make 80. I mean it's a hard job and and whether it's uh, local transit or or or, or bus staying you know it's there's no way we're going to fill these jobs and attract people if if people are making more money doing other things. Right, if the new resources could go there. 
And sure. just okay. to, sorry, just to clarify, so at least in Region 1, this is not true around the state of Colorado and other regions, we are looking good this year for snowplow drivers. Our vacancy rate with the initiatives that we input, including um, snow bonuses and uh, housing allowances for our Denver Metro workers, we, we are looking good for coverage for snowplow drivers, particularly compared to last year. So knock on wood, we stay with those um, levels, but we have seen really good um, retention of our employees and lower attriculation this year. So we're very happy with that. There it is. So from a planning perspective, just a couple of items. One, the we're getting close to wrapping up the initial report uh, that was required as part of House Bill 23-1101, which is the TPR uh, boundary and um, administrative study. So that report should be done next month, and then it will be taken to the commission for review and action anticipated in January and then um, due before June of next year. Um, if I haven't mentioned this previously, we do have a new dashboard regarding our 10-year plan projects. Um, it's our initial cut of that, but it does have some great information about um, CDOT's 10-year plan. In particular of interest to this group would be the Region 1 projects, which is the Denver metro area. That's available on our, dash, uh, on our website um, for review. And uh, uh, if you have any questions or you're interested, please contact me. And I'll be happy to send the link. And if you have any um, uh, suggestions for improvement were all ears on that in order to increase the transparency of these projects. And then finally, um, one of our new enterprises, the Fuels Impact Enterprise, will meet again this month right after the Transportation Commission. Um, mostly administrative pieces on here, but as we get closer to looking at um, uh, collecting funds and looking at projects, um, we'll keep this group updated because there's a lot of local uh, funds that go to local entities, particular, I believe, the city of Aurora, Adams County, and Commerce City, I believe, specifically in the legislation, funds go to those jurisdictions for freight projects. And uh, that wraps up the, my uh, update this month. Very much. We will transition to RCV. General Manager, CEO Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Deborah Johnson, General Manager and CEO of RTD. Before I delve into my report, I'll yield the floor to the directors that are present for any information they'd like to share. Thank you, GM CEO. Uh, Vince Buzik, uh, Director, District A. So for the third year in a row, RTD has conducted a survey of customers, community members. Um, it, it, it's a big process uh, and something that we have undertaken since the arrival of GM CEO Johnson and uh, with her assistance. It used to report that the opinions, net promoter scores, uh, and so forth have increased significantly among all of the, the survey respondents. Interestingly enough, uh, well over 70% of bus and rail customers are either satisfied or very satisfied with RTD service. And this touches a whole bunch of data points from cleanliness to security to on-time performance and, and, and all kinds of things. So um, the, on the community survey side, some of these people are, are riders, but the vast majority, almost 80%, are either non-users or very seldom users of RTD. And of those people surveyed, 84% believe that RTD provides value to the region. And 87% believe that RTD funding should be somewhat or much greater than what it is. Can't agree. Um, so I, I think those numbers are really great. Um, and most importantly, uh, it's all down, well, although the board of directors would love to take credit for this, this is all down to our GM CEO, Deborah Johnson, who has done yeoman's work to fix things that have been systematic problems for quite some time and we're starting to come around. And, and also, the survey looked at national averages among similarly situated transit agencies, and we are head and shoulders better than, than those numbers. Thank you, GM uh, CEO Johnson, and I'll turn this over to you now. Thank you very much. That's quite um, an intro. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Director Busick, but no one person can do anything alone. I may have brought forward some um, suggestions about how we can ensure we um, 
could manage our infrastructure and service delivery better because we needed to have data points to make informed decisions, but it's been a collective effort and we still have many, many areas of opportunity. Hence, that's why we're focusing on getting back to basics, people power and uh, the welcoming transit environment. Uh, what I will touch upon um, are a couple of things. Wanted to share uh, next week going before the Board of Directors for its consideration is RTD's legislative and government relations program, which we have uh, started uh, three years ago. And some notable elements that I want to qualify as we look at our state um, initiatives or undertakings. It's to uh, support legislation to enhance penalties for assault-related crimes on RTD frontline employees. Um, as Director Music was talking about different uh, agencies nationwide, um, it's unfortunate that here in the state of Colorado, uh, we have not uh, taken the lead of other uh, states. And while I'm not trying to bash any other states, you'd be surprised in the state of Florida, they have penalties and they provide more funding for public transportation. And so what we're trying to do is work in tandem and find a bill sponsor contingent upon the boards. Um, the board's consideration of this element within our legislative and government relations program. And the other notable uh, initiative uh, I would say that we have included in our state program would be support legislation to provide funding for zero fare for youth um, going forward. And there already has been talk about that support uh, through the Transportation Legislative Review Committee and the introduction of their uh, bills. But I just wanted to share that that's something that RTD as an agency um, is considering, and I leave that to the board to uh, make a sage decision about the path forward. Um, there's no surprise that, you know, everything that glitters is in gold, and we have a lot of dull metals within our auspices. With that as a backdrop, talking about getting back to basics, we have to ensure that we're maintaining our current transit network in a state of good repair, because oftentimes it has been an in disrepair because of competing priorities since back to basics. So I know that there's been a lot of angst and frustration relative to our slow moving light rail lines. That's due to the fact that we have had to do some necessary work. And let me be the first to tell you without, uh, without fear of becoming the skunk at the garden party, but we are going to continue with that necessary work. And um, just over the weekend, we removed uh, construction materials and equipment relative to a project that had been ongoing since April that impacted the EH and R lines. We were basically um, improving the coping panels, putting the caps back on top of retaining walls. That's what the coping panels are along um, I-25 between Broadway Station in Denver and Lincoln Station in Lone Tree. And so we started recognizing that we have a small window in which to do work here due to weather. Uh, we started that work in April, and so we wrapped that up, and we'll be starting again. And there's always lessons learned. What we endeavor to do is we go forward and commence with the work to complete it in the spring of 2024 is ensure we have schedule adjustments made. So instead of saying, oh, my God, here is a 20-minute headway and there'll be delays, incorporate that in because we have to have flaggers quite naturally when we're using single track and we have to ensure that we are adhering to safety protocols and things along those lines. And also as we talk about getting back to basics, stay tuned uh, with our downtown loop that's our original light rail line that opened in 1994, we are going to shut down that area to repair that rail, recognizing that that rail was laid well beyond 30 years ago. So uh, that's what I have to offer up and I appreciate the opportunity to share and thank you for your attention. Move ahead. Hello. Hey. We'll move ahead to the report from the Regional Air Quality Council. Michael Silverstein. Oh, thank sir. you. Thank you so much. Um, just a, a short update from the from the RAC and its work. Um, the Air Quality Control Commission is considering now the latest uh, iteration of our ozone planning efforts, and so you you'll be uh, reading about, I'm sure, in the media how um, how either great the plan is or how poor the plan is, uh, depending on your perspective or somewhere. And we, we thankfully land right in the middle of all that. And so we know that we're going to have a, uh, uh, you know, a, a good hearing and a, and a good process with the Air Quality Control Commission over the fall. In addition, a number of, of really um, um, innovative and uh, 
I think, first in the nation kind of regulatory initiatives going in front of the Air Quality Control Commission related to lawn and garden equipment and uh, oil and gas operations specifically. Um, this week, the Air Commission is considering a, a Colorado Clean Cars uh, uh, regulatory update, which essentially requires um, the sale of all electric vehicles. Um, 80 percent of new sales by, I believe, 2032 uh, will be the new standard for, um, for new sales to meet those targets. And so it's a, it's a electric future, and, um, but it will it, take time to get there. So in the meantime, we have to do things to continue to drive down emissions from our, our mobile sources and all the other emission categories in the, uh, in the region until, um, you know, we're, we're in a different technological um, paradigm. Um, also, the Regional Air Quality Council briefed the uh, Legislative um, Interim Committee on Ozone Air Quality uh, last Friday, along with uh, many other stakeholders. This committee has been holding hearings over the, uh, the summer and, and throughout these uh, past few months going into the winter on um, what could be done, what should be done to improve air quality from a legislative perspective. And I know Dr. Cog is, is in the queue for next month, and, and many um, of the stakeholders have had opportunities to provide their perspectives to the committee. And um, really the RAC, um, our, our goal was to educate the committee um, on the fundamentals of, of you know, why we're a, an ozone non-attainment area, what's been done in the past, and what the plans are for the future, and, um, and get their support for initiatives that we um, are advancing, and to address uh, questions that come up um, and testimony from other parties that we feel are either a need expansion or are, are just not correct. So we took that opportunity. We think we thought we got a great reception from the committee. And um, we did introduce to the committee a funding proposal for approximately $7 million to um, incentivize the electrification of lawn and garden equipment. This is a, a real priority of the RAC, a, a really uncontrolled, surprisingly important emission control category. And if we're going to have a regulatory future, we're hoping that we can pave the way um, for local governments, uh, state agencies, uh, local contractors and commercial operations and citizens to, um, to receive um, help in, in, in transitioning from gas-powered equipment to electric and so that um, it's much easier to be in compliance if regulations are, are passed that would take effect in a couple of years. And so uh, that's an initiative that we'll, we hope to gain um, support from, from all of you in the uh, legislative process, uh, you know, funding through the legislature. That's always uh, a challenge. RAC has never approached the legislature before, so we're rookies in this, uh, in this uh, playground. So we, we, we hope that we're successful and, and could use the uh, support of, uh, of our partners uh, throughout the region. Very much. Any questions for uh, Michael? Hey, seeing none. Um, our next meeting is November 14th, a week after Election Day. Ballots come out this week, so be sure to get those in wherever you are, whatever you're voting on. Uh, and with that, any other matters for members? We are adjourned. Thank you very much for being here.